and just this talk about, you know, bodies, bodies moving and this and that, you know, and you said it's like my whole world, it's like I have to give up my whole world, and, mm -hmm. and from the ego's perspective, that's exactly how it could look, because that's what the ego is, it's a sense of separate, as if one has a, a separate sense of self, and all the preferences and all the personal memories and all the, the goals and ambitions that seem to be private, that seems to be unique, separate than everyone else, that's all part of that concept. That's what I was thinking about was just this feeling that that the ego is is just kicking in with everything it has. The ego is just seeing more and more clearly what's going on here and it's just like pulling out all the stops. It just feels so strong and powerful mm -hmm. at times when that happens. Well, let's look at that one. You know, the that is a metaphor that we've used, certainly, that the ego's pulling out all the stops and the ego's having a backlash and so on and so yeah. forth, and we're describing it in the metaphor as if the ego is an entity, as if it kind of has a life of its own and it exists. And that but, it has the power to do that. And that it has a power. But it but it only comes down to the idea that that the ego is a decision and the Holy Spirit is a decision and that it's it comes down to I'm either an ego or I'm not an ego. I mean it, it starts to come down to looking at, at it that way. If you can see where that's going beyond the idea that the ego is kicking in. Because then you can see where you can get into talking about it and describing it that way and it just seems to give it a reality. So instead of describing it that way, it probably would be more helpful to just say, I am deciding for the ego. Everything is a, a statement. The, the mind is, by everything it thinks and says and does, it's teaching what, what it believes it is. You can't leave it at that. I mean, that has to be just a stepping stone or a metaphor because where, where are you if you say, I am presently deciding for the ego. That's again, a definition of hell. Again, who is that I, right? And yeah. that's what you're getting at. Yeah, so it's, like, it's helpful. It's a helpful stepping stone to say, I'm not upset because of what happened yesterday or what happened 10 years ago or what I think will happen mm -hmm. tomorrow. I'm upset because it's a present decision. Mm -hmm. Now, that would be a definition of wrong-mindedness. Wrong a present decision for the ego is, is wrong-mindedness. Mm -hmm. And wrong-mindedness is the problem. At one point Jesus said all sickness is wrong-mindedness. It doesn't seem that way to the deceived mind. It seems like there's many, many problems and many, many forms of sickness that don't have anything to do with wrong-mindedness. But Jesus says that decision for the ego, for wrong-mindedness, is sickness. Now, right-mindedness is the correction for wrong-mindedness. Therefore, we're back to the thing of discernment between the right mind and the wrong mind. That's the key, is discernment. The key is in coming to see that, as it seemed as when we were in, at Christus down in Cincinnati one day, we had this session somewhere and I remember there was this glee and this joy and the statement was made, I am the right mind. We, we trace it, trace it, trace it, trace it. You have to come to see that that's the only possibility. That is the only possibility. Mm -hmm. I am the right mind. I am right minded. Not I am right minded some of the time, but that period. period. And from that clarity, then the wrong mind is dissolved. Another way of saying it is that the right mind must be a constant state because there, in, in reality there is no vacillation back and forth between right mind and wrong mind. That's just a metaphor. And if the right mind is seen as a constant state, then that 
the wrong mind is no more because, as we talked about earlier, these two thought systems are mutually exclusive. I mean, that, that is the awareness mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that they are mutually exclusive, that, that it can't be both. It never was and it never will be. Right. So that's what this immediacy of salvation is about, is really coming to see that there is no gap between me and my brother, because there's just one mind. There is no so gap between private minds. What, to maybe reword what I'm saying when I say I'm deciding for the ego, it's like saying I am the right mind, and then tacking on the end of that, but right now, I'm denying it. I'm going to deny it in this instant. Mm -hmm. Which is meaningless. Yeah. If you really yeah, look at it. Statement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like, I'm right-minded, I'm going to pretend I'm not. I can't say I am the right mind and not recognize it at the same time. Mm -hmm. A body can say the words, I am the right mind. There's no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. A body can say the words, I am as God created me. The thing about it is, that's why we go into this so deeply when we talk about preferences, when we talk about ordering of thoughts, when we talk about judgments. Because the right mind is a state where there is no ordering of thoughts, where there is no preferences, where there is no judgment. Images are just seen as images. They aren't arranged. They aren't constructed and put together in a certain way. That's laughable. I mean, that's seen as impossible. If, if ordering thoughts automatically seems to bring about pain and guilt and fear, what's the point? <laughs> you know, at one point Jesus says, you know, that those in, in heaven, so to speak, or even if you talked about it in terms of the real world, have seen the temptation but have have seen the falsity of it. They, they see no value in judgment. Mm -hmm. And until I see that, I can't stop judging. You could say it that way, or you, or you could say, I don't know who I am. <laughs> so, we, we just said, until I see that, here we are with the immediacy of salvation. <laughs> Let's question that until. Yeah. <laughs> salvation is immediate. Unless you so perceive it, you will be afraid of it, believing that the risk of loss is great between the time its purpose is made yours and its effects will come to you. In this form is the error still obscured that is the source of fear. Salvation would wipe out the space you see between you still, and let you instantly become as one. And it is here you fear the loss would lie. Do not project this fear to time, for time is not the enemy that you perceive. Time is as neutral as the body is, except in terms of what you see it for. If you would keep a little space between you and your brother still, you then would want a little time in which forgiveness is withheld a little while. And this but makes the interval between the time in which forgiveness is withheld from you and given seem dangerous, with terror justified. It gets to cause and effect. If, if a mind believes in the reality, reality of the ego, it believes in a false cause, or we could say a, a cause with a little c, instead of a capital C for, for God. And it must be that the mind is holding on to that belief in that false cause now. Jesus is saying here, don't project the error, don't project this fear to time, for time is not the enemy you perceive. The old cliché is about time heals all wounds. And it's not true. Time doesn't heal all wounds. As a metaphor, you could say the Holy Spirit's use of time heals all wounds. But even that you have to see as a metaphor. Because the, the whole awareness that brings the release is that there is no linear time. 
There's only now. There's only the holy instant. Time is not in the healing. Time is in the sickness, as it were. The belief in linear yeah. time is the sickness. It's the sickness. So how can what is sick contribute, contribute to healing? To healing. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Does everyone have an understanding of what the word hypothetical means? I don't know. I didn't see you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what, do you know? what use are you going to give it? <laughs> Every thought that you hold in your minds right now is hypothetical. So even the thought that we're gathered here this morning for a teaching learning session is hypothetical. Anything related to time at all would be hypothetical. You, you shared a thought about, I have to end it, leave this session at 12 yeah. to go on. That's the hypothetical. You shared that you have, you're off on Wednesday next week. That's hypothetical. We talked about, you know, looking for a job or this or that. That's hypothetical. Anything that you think you've done, experiences that seem to have happened in the past, so that seem to be concrete experiences, real experiences, those are hypothetical. Is it the, race, the relationship to time that makes it hypothetical? Yeah, the whole projected world and, and the belief in linear time is what the hypothetical is about. Okay. So anything I could talk about or have talked about or think I can talk about is hypothetical. Because what else, what is there to talk about? If there's no time, there's no space, there's no images, there's no form, how do you talk about that? What we're back with is go for the experience. I know a lot of times, to use the example of course groups, where you go into the ideas, you go deeper, 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 deeper. But, but David, what if you were at such and such a city at night, and, and what if a man came up to you with a knife and said such and such and such and such, you know, hypotheticals, hypotheticals. You know, the mind wants to come up with a lot of hypotheticals. It believes in an objective world. But that's no more hypothetical than an experience that you seem to have actually had. Right. I can't get that. I don't understand that. Well, the, the teachings that we're coming to is that now is all that there is. And now is free of images and form completely. Mm -hmm. When we say now in the present moment, don't think that you know what that is. You know, we've heard these phrases for a long time, live in the moment, be, be totally present. The deceived mind doesn't have a clue. So now doesn't mean just now the In five time. the five of us sitting here. Right. Now is is to the deceived mind unknown. And in the ultimate sense now is all it can be known because it That's it, all there is. It is. If you go to the section in the course, you know, called I Need Do Nothing, you know, in there it's described as there are no bodies in the holy instant. At no single instant does the body exist at all. That's a, a direct line from the I need do nothing section in here. <laughs> Very interesting. At no single instant does the body exist at all. That's what makes this seeming perce perception as hypothetical as, as hypothetically going into Mountain Jacks. That gives a different meaning to hypothetical than probably the meaning that <laughs> you were thinking about when I asked the question. Another way of looking at hypothetical is the belief that cause and effect are apart, or that there's a gap between cause and effect. Everything in this world seems is this world is made up of distorted cause and effect relationships. It's part of a, a fixed delusional system of of. Um, distorted cause-effect relationships. In the beginning of the psychotherapy pamphlet, Jesus makes a reference to that in the sense that that time, the stepping stone to coming to the Holy Instant is to see that, that all the perceptions that seem to be occurring, that seem to occur as events and situations and happenings over linear time are 
simultaneous.